And for those of you that might not know him, I would like to introduce Mr. Waylon Dabbs, a very good friend of mine. We've been friends for probably getting close to 20, 20. Long time. It has been. A long time. I'm not going to, I'm not going to make us feel old tonight. <laughs> we just, uh, we're good friends. And uh, this gentleman's going to feed you. I appreciate his friendship. And uh, I just love you. Love you, brother. Thank you for being here, Thank brother. Thank you. Um, nice crowd tonight. It's good to see everyone. Uh, Alan, I think, oversold it just a little bit. So uh, hopefully all of you will leave somewhat satisfied. So we'll do the best we can to give you something uh, that you can learn something. You know, I was talking to Caitlin earlier. Um, you know, where Jesus said you make void the word of God through your tradition. Okay, I really didn't understand what that meant till now. You know, where you can give someone, you know, plain, factual, not a, no opinion, you know, my computer just shut down. Uh, no opinions. This is what it says, and, and their tradition won't even let them see it. You know, I was, I was that way. You know, but, but a, a critical study of the Bible uh, can teach us a lot of things. If we just slow down and take a critical look at some things and be open, okay, to exploring what we believe. Is it truth or is it not true? Because at the end of the day, if you have the truth, it can stand the test. It can, plain and simple. The truth can stand the test, okay, a falsehood cannot ever stand a critical test of Scripture. And that's just facts. You know, that's how, you know, when I got to talk to Alan, I'm like, take this verse of Scripture, clear your mind, and prove it ain't true. Prove that. You know, two and a half years later, he's calling me, well, I need help. I don't forget how long it was, but, but uh, that's how it happens. You know, and, 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 you know, if you're out and you're talking to people, you know, one thing you got to understand, uh, unlike our old teachings, especially mine, I'm not sure of everyone's background, but it was my responsibility, okay? Yep. I had to go out and win souls. What I did could determine on whether or not someone did or did not get saved or if they would go to hell forever or go to heaven forever. What I did, Okay. When I figured out that it, it's really got nothing to do with me, I just plant seed. If they believe, good. Okay, if they don't believe right now, they will. Okay, I, I don't live in that hopelessness of if they don't believe, they're doomed forever. You know, I just don't live, so I don't worry about it. I just check this out. Got any questions, give me a call. And more often than not, they'll come back and we'll talk more and we'll come back and we'll talk more. And uh, eventually, people go, you know, there's something to this, and they'll start their own journey. You know, God's got everybody's journey, and he's got that laid out, and we'll all walk it, and we'll all end up, you know, bowing our knee to him and confessing him Lord one day, every one of us. But one thing I'm going to talk about is something that tradition has really turned around. It's like I was telling Kate in earlier, an unbiased study word, an unbiased study of the word will land you in one place, one place. Okay, and that is that Jesus Christ is exactly who he said he was, Amen. the Savior of the world. Okay, and he will accomplish exactly what his Father sent him to do, and that's to save the world. Okay, a, an unbiased, untraditional study will land you in only one place, and that's it. Okay, it doesn't matter how you try to bend it, twist it. I tried, and once you get, once you start saying, okay, 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 it's like quicksand. You just can't get out of it. The more you struggle, the, the more you sink into the truth. And then you find out, you know, it's not really that hard. It's actually pretty simple. You know, so one thing that I've really tried to, to dedicate myself to is making the scripture simple for people. You know, that's why I started a YouTube channel, The Simple Truth. If you don't know where it's at, check it out. You know, I post every now and then just a little short nuggets of truth. Check it out. And uh, post comments. Let me know what you think. But what we're going to look at tonight is we're going to look at a very concordant study of the word soul. Okay? A, lot of, a lot's been made of 
the human soul. Has anybody ever heard the comment, your undying soul? Or your immortal soul? You know, and all of this garb that comes in to the soul. Now, how many doctrines is really tied to the soul? So let's think about it. Okay, that there's the immortal soul. Okay, and then, then because of the immortal soul, the doctrine of, well, as soon as you die, you either go straight to heaven or you go straight to hell because you have a part of you that never dies. Right? Okay, that's propped up. Okay, the doctrine of the Trinity is propped up. Okay, man is a triune being because God is a triune being. Ever heard that? Okay, so a lot of things have come from a misunderstanding and a mishandling of the concept of the soul. Okay, and we're going to take a very short and simple and factual walk through the first nine chapters of Genesis. Okay, and we're going to study the word soul, and then we're going to move into the New Testament for a few verses. Okay, and before you leave tonight, okay, I hope you at least have enough to say, you know, I'm going to check this out and see whether or not this is true. Okay, so another thing, you know, talking about the immortality of soul, you know, the greatest lie that's ever been told was the first lie, where Satan said, thou shalt not surely die, you know, God told Adam and Eve, if you eat of this fruit, you're going to die. Satan said, thou shalt not surely die. Okay, that was the greatest lie and the first lie ever told. Okay, and then in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, if you want to turn there. Okay, it says, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Okay, and from this verse, the doctrine that man inherited or somehow got given or developed a soul, okay, was birthed. Okay, now what's so funny about that is the verse doesn't say that he was given a soul. The verse doesn't say that he inherited a soul. The verse says he became a soul, okay, followed or preceded by the key word living. Okay, man became a living soul. Now, the word there, soul, is from the Hebrew word, nephesh. Okay, and all that simply means is a living creature. Okay, and the word nephesh occurs 754 times in the Old Testament. In the authorized version, it is translated soul 472 times, while in other places, it's, in, in, which is 282 places, it's represented by 44 different words okay 44 okay now we all know and, and and if you anyone does a concordant study and what i mean by concordant it means you pay attention to the words when you study the bible okay usage is what defines the word okay how many teachers we got here teacher 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 any other teacher okay usage is what defines the word wrong or right how a word is used if it's used multiple times in a certain way, it defines a word. Okay, that's why someone can't come up and say, you know, this is white. And in a, a chapter over, this white can't mean black because it's white. Okay, it doesn't matter how you, you, you just can't use white to replace black or black to replace white. You know, that's when you can do the study of the words aeon and you can get a graph. Of, it doesn't really mean eternity because of the way it's used. Okay, something that is means forever, without time, without end, can't, can never be used as something of limited time because it's contradictory. Okay, so it's usage is what defines word. And what we're going to look at is we're going to look at how God chose to use in Holy Scriptures the word napish, soul, and we're going to learn exactly what that is. Now, Genesis 2-7 is not the first place that it was mentioned. Okay, so look at Genesis 1-20. This is the very first time that the word napish is used. And it says, And God said, Let the water bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and the fowl that they may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. Now the word napish there is the word life. Okay, 
So the, the word nephesh there is the word life. So already we have, okay, nephesh equals life. Okay, simple enough. Okay, man, 2-7, became a living soul. Here the word nephesh is translated as life. Okay, the second place it's used is in the very next verse, Genesis 1, 21. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Anyone want to guess what the word napish is? Creature. Okay, now what is creature defining here? God made great whales and every living creature. Okay, now, now, now let me make sure something perfectly clear. God don't create man until Genesis 2-7. Okay? The very first creation of anything that lives is described by the word napish, soul. Before man was ever created, we had souls on the earth. Okay? So think about that. Okay? So now we've got creature. Okay, not only one creature, but every living creature. That's what it said. Let's look at the next place. Genesis 1, 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. What is the word napish? Creature. And what is the word creature they're defining in this verse? Okay, we've got one, something that's living. So it's living creature, right? And then he goes to describe, okay, just, just in case you're not getting it. Okay, let me help you out. Okay, cattle. Every living creature. And he goes to define, okay, this is what I mean by every living creature. We got cattle. Okay, moo. We got souls. Okay, who had a hamburger this evening? Over here. You had a soul. You, you ate a dead soul. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Creeping thing. I wonder what that is. How about the little ants and the beetles and those things you see on TV? Snakes. Okay. After his creeping thing. And beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. So here we got a second use of the word soul, and that is used to describe, well, I'm not going to write it, cattle, creeping things, and beast. Again, a whole chapter before God created man. Okay? Think about that. Have you ever heard that anywhere else? Okay? And, and it would take anyone in this room or anyone that's watching 30 minutes in a concordance to prove what I'm saying is true. I'm not giving you my opinion. I'm giving you chapter, verse, and even the word that was translated from Napish. Let's look at the next usage, Genesis 1.30. And every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. Okay, what is the word nephesh? Life. Okay, it's the word life. Okay, so up until now, Genesis 1.30, everything that God created, everything, that's what it says, every living thing, okay, wherein there is life, he described by using the word nephesh, soul. Okay, so are you beginning to understand a little bit about how the usage of soul is a little different than how religion has propped it up? Okay, so let's, let's, look, at, let's look at some more. Okay, Genesis 2, 7, we've read that one already. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Okay, he was living. Described by Napish. Let's look at 219. 
And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. What is the word napish? Creature. Okay, if Adam named it, it was a soul. It was a napish. Okay, let's look at the next one. Let's go to Genesis chapter 9. Verses 4 and 5. Let me chew this map. <laughs> but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, ye shall not eat. And surely, and surely your blood of your lives will I require at the, at the hand. Of every beast I will require it. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Okay, now the word napish is used three times in these two verses. Okay, it's used at first, but flesh with the life, the word life there is the word napish. Okay, and it says, and surely your, uh, surely your blood of your lives, the word lives there is the word napish. Okay, and at the end of the verse it says, I will require the life, napish, of the man. Okay, let's look at the next one, Genesis 9.10. And it says, with every living creature that is with you, of the, with you of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark and every beast of the earth. Okay, here's the story of Noah. Noah put two of every creature on the ark. Okay, and that is the word napish there is the word creature. And with every living creature. Okay, so everything that Adam put on the ark was a soul, was a nafish. Okay, and it's qualified by the word living. Okay, focus on that a minute. It's qualified by the word living. Okay, so we've got it, we've got it being translated life, lives, living creature. Okay, in 2-7, it was a living soul. Okay, but it's always talking about something that's living. Does that make sense? Okay, and we're going to get a little bit more into to what soul can mean as you begin to look at it through the Bible in, in just a second. But let's look at, let's look at a few more. Uh, Genesis 9, 12, And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. When he came out of the ark, he's talking about the rainbow. That's the story. Genesis 9, 15, and 16. The word creature there was napish in 12. It says, and I, remember, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me, you, and every living creature, uh, creature of all flesh, and the water, and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. Now, this verse is kind of special, okay, because it's translated by the word creature twice. In verse 15, it says, me, you, and every living creature. In verse 16, there at the end, it says, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. In this instance, okay, it is man, beast, creeping thing, everything is lumped in to the word napish, okay, that's living. Pick up on that, okay. It's translated creature, but it's normally be right after or before qualified by the word living, Okay, key in on that. Now, let's talk about it a little bit, and we're going to go a little quicker here, you know, if some of the other words that it's translated. Okay, the word soul is, is translated mind in Genesis 3, 23, 8. Let's read it. And he communed with them, saying, If it be your mind that I should bury my dead out of, thy, out of my sight, hear me and entreat of me to Ephron, the son of Zohor. 
Now, right here is, is it, the word napish is translated as mind. And the whole thought process there, it says, if it be your mind. In other words, if it's okay with you, right, if it's okay with you, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bury them here pretty much. Okay, so now we're getting into a little thought process, okay, and you're going to learn a little bit how the soul can be used and how it even more so means living, okay, because it's now be, be, it's beginning to be tied to your emotions, okay, to your consciousness. Let's read another one. Deuteronomy 18.6, And a Levite come from any of, of thy gates out of Israel where he sojourned, and come with all the desire of his mind into the place which the Lord shall choose. The word napish there is translated by the word desire. Okay, so now we're getting into some, some you know, what a human or a living thing wants. Not just human, but what they want, okay, and, and how they think, their consciousness, what makes them kind of who they are, right? Now let's look at another one. Deuteronomy 28, 65. And among these nations shalt thou find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. But the Lord shall give thee a trembling heart and failing of the eyes and sorrow of the mind. Okay, the word there is mind, but it's, it, what it's, what's it talking about? It says sorrow of the napish. Okay, so now we can see, okay, now we're talking about a living thing that's got emotions. Okay, they desire. Okay, he has a will. If you're okay with this, basically I'll do this. And now we see that the nafish can have sorrow, right? Okay, let's look at it again. Let's look at something else. Here it's used of God's mind. 1 Samuel 2.35, and this is God talking. It says, And I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. Here it's used of God's mind. Okay, what he thinks. Okay, did God have a soul? Huh? Okay, or, or is that just part of him? Okay, I think we need to distinguish here as we go on. You know, I mean, we don't have souls. It's not something we have. It's what we are. Okay, it's what we are when we become alive. Okay, remember what it said there of man, God breathed in his nostrils the breath of life. Life came, and then man became a living soul. Okay, it's talking about life. It's not what you have. It's, it's not, you don't have a soul. You're alive. Thus, you are a soul. Does that make sense? Okay, let's look at some more, and we'll see what we're talking about. Okay, let's turn to 2 Samuel 17, 8. It says, and I can't pronounce some of the names, so you have to forget, forgive me. It says, Thor, <laughs> right? <laughs> Thor said, Husha, thou knowest thy father and his men, and they be mighty men, and they be chaffed in their minds as a bear robbed of her whelps in the field, that the father is a man of war, and will not lodge with the people. Right here it's translated the words minds again, but it's describing that mind as being chaffed. I had to look that up. That means bitter. Okay? That means he was upset. He was mad. So, so it's again, it's about an emotion that this has. It's about being alive and emotional and moving around. Let's look at some more. 2 Kings 9.15 but King Joram was returned to, the, to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which the Syrians had given him when he fought with Hazel, king of Syria. And Jehu said, If it be your minds, let none, let none go forth, escape out of the city to go tell Jezreel. In other words, if it's okay with you, kill them all. Don't let them escape. But again, he's asking them to make a decision. What do you desire to do? It's translated by the word napish. Okay, now I'm just going to, not going to read the verses, but I'm going to read, I'm going to tell you what verse it is and what it's translated at. Okay, in 1 Chronicles 28, 9, it's translated as willing. In Jeremiah 15, 1, uh, it's translated, also used of God, talking about God being willing. 
Okay, Ezekiel 23, 17. Okay, I'll read that one. And the Babylonians came to her in the bed of love, and they defiled her with their whoredom. And she was polluted with them, and her mind was alienated from them. It's translated again as mind after something that, that her mind was alienated. In other words, she was separated emotionally from these people. Again, it's, it's about emotions. It's about life. Okay, let's move on. It's translated as will in Deuteronomy 24. And it shall be if thou will have no delight in her, then thou shalt let her go whether she will. Napish. Okay, rather she will, but thou shalt not sell her at all for money. Uh, thou shalt make merchandise of her because thou hast humbled her. Here it's talking about the will. Again, the desire, the emotion, okay, that comes with being alive. Okay, now let me make a comment. That's not only talking about humans. You know that, right? I mean, we are a higher intellect, okay, but dogs have emotions. Cats have emotions. I've seen birds get mad. <laughs> you, you know, uh, so, so it's talking about any living thing. Okay, so let me ask a question. Okay, out there is a bush. Is that a soul? Huh? Why is that not a soul? Huh? It doesn't breathe. doesn't have emotions. It's not moving. Right? It's not, it's not alive with emotions. It doesn't have a will. It doesn't have a mind. It can't get bitter. It can't get mad. You know, it can't get chaffed. It, you know, so, so there's a separation between... Plant life, although it is alive, okay, but it's not a napish. It's never defined or translated from the word napish because it doesn't have an emotional response to anything. Okay, now, now understanding that is going to help us as we move forward to help us understand some of the complicated scriptures where, people, where you see in a verse body, soul, and spirit. You know, the people want to try to preach you have a soul okay you're a triune being look at that verse understanding that emotional part of that is going to help you understand what that means so let's look at let's look at a few more ecclesiastes 6 9 it said better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the desire i'm sorry let me read that again better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the desire uh, this is also vanity and vexation of spirit. Here Solomon translates it or by the word desire again. It's all hooked to the emotions. Now let's look at something else. Let's go into the New Testament. Okay, in the New Testament, we, we know that a Greek word, anybody ever heard of the subjugate? Huh? That is a Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. Okay. So why, that, why that's important is if you can go back and say, okay, okay, the Greek, the Greek translated Genesis 2-7, and where they used the word soul, it was replaced with this word in the Greek. Okay, and we have that exact situation. Let me find it. In 1 Corinthians 15-45, and, and Paul says this, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Okay? Now, the word soul there is translated from the Greek word called pushe, I think. Okay? It's P-S-U-C-H-E. Okay? And that word is translated. We're going to look at a few places it's translated, but the, the, the direct Greek equivalent to the Hebrew word napish is the Greek word 5590, it means pushy, and it just simply means breath. It just means breath. So let's look at a few verses here that this is talking about. Okay, Matthew 10, 28. Now these are going to be some of your hellfire verses that's going to talk about, uh, you know, you've heard in churches to beat you over the head sometime. Matthew 10, 28, and it says, Fear not them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul, Peshi, okay, Nathish, okay, uh, kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. 
And we all know that that word hell there is the word Gehenna. Okay, that's a lesson for another time. I'm sure Alan fully covered that. Okay, but here, we, has anybody heard this verse? And it's used, okay, one, to make you fear hell. But two, fear God because he can put your body and soul in hell. Right? So, so from what we've learned about what the word actually means, what can we take from that saying? Okay, now just think about it. You know, you can kill your body. You can cut this arm off and it's dead. But you still be alive. You still have emotions. You still have an appetite. You can still be walking around. Okay? So, so fear God because he can hurt your body. Right? But also fear him because he can kill you. He can just destroy life. Okay, so, so it's not talking about your actual soul being going to hell. Okay, Gehenna. Okay, it's talking about your life ending in Gehenna. Does that make sense? Okay, the word there is destroy. Okay, but he, he's, he not only can take your body and throw it in there, he's going to destroy who you are in Gehenna. Now, I've heard Alan teach about Gehenna. Okay, the only people that were throwing Gehenna are people that lost their burying place. In other words, they lost their honor. They lost who they were as a person when they were through there. Their families disowned them, right? They lost themselves in Gehenna. Okay, so, so that's what you're to fear. It's not you're going to some eternal, your living soul is going to go to a fire pit. Okay, it's talking about not only killing the body, but it's talking about taking... Killing who you are as a person, as a human being, your life that you had, your remembrance, how people remember you, right? Okay, let's look at some others. Matthew 16, 26. For what is, for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Naphish, okay, or Peshi in the New Testament. And what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Okay, now, from what we've learned, soul means, okay, that doesn't mean you're going to give your soul up and it's going to go to hell. Okay, okay, none of that. Okay, that means you're giving up who you are as a person. Okay, you're losing, losing your reputation, you're losing your honor. Okay, and you can be losing your life. Okay, but, but it's not only just about being alive. The word soul is about our emotions. It's about our desires. It's about who we are. As a, it's what our life, it's what makes us who we are. Does that make sense? It's used in that way. Okay, so what does it profit a man if he gained the whole world, but he loses himself? You, you, you know what I'm saying? He loses who he is. You, you, you know what I'm saying? It's not talking about losing your soul to hell. You, you lose who you are because of it. Let's look at some others. Acts 2.27. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. The word soul there is the word peshi, napish. Okay, so it's, well, I've been up here a long time already, 45 minutes. So as we keep going on through here, it's used in the same way over and over and over again. Okay, and, and because we've looked at in a critical way how the word is used okay what have we learned it's just your life okay you're alive therefore you are a soul okay and it's also tied into your emotions what makes you who you are as an individual your appetites your will your desires you can find the word napish where it talks about the soul being hungry, what, they thir what it thirsts for, what it desires, you as a person. Okay, that's what the word napish and the word peshi is used as. Now, let's look at a problem verse in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. And it says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless, into the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
okay? Be, be preserved blameless. Now, what we've learned about the soul, he obviously, our body, we got that. What about our soul? What kind of implication can that have? How about our desires and our appetites and who we are as a person being blameless? That's not saying you have a soul. It's not saying that. Okay? But tradition doesn't let people get there. It's who you are as a person. Okay? It's what that's talking about. Okay? Why? Because we've learned from the usage of the word, it's got nothing to do with the separate entity that lives inside of me. Nothing to do with that. That's okay, not what it's talking about. Okay, it's just talking about our emotions, our desires, the fact that we are alive. Okay, it's what makes us a soul. Can you say that emotions Yes. Yes, exactly. Okay, it's what makes you who you are. Okay, but it's a result of being alive. Okay, now I want to look, I want to point out something about how we can really shut down. Okay, the, the thought of the immortal soul. Okay, let me find. Souls, okay, is plainly said, the word napish is plainly described as being dead in several places in the Bible. Okay, so let's look at, let's look at uh, Numbers 9, 6, and 7. Numbers 9, 6, and 7. Okay, and it says, and there were certain men who were defiled by the dead body of a man. Okay, the word napish there is translated body. Okay, the concordant literal says a deceased soul. Okay, but right here you see that this soul is dead. Dead. Okay, and this same concept is found in Leviticus 19.28, Leviticus 21.1, Leviticus 22.4, Numbers 5.2, Numbers 6.11, Numbers 9.6 and 7, Numbers 9.10, Leviticus 21.11, Numbers 6.6, 6, Numbers 19.11, Numbers 19.13, and Haggai 2.3. All of these verses plainly state that the soul is dead. Okay, whatever the verse was talking about, it was dead. So how does that line up with it being immortal? It can't. Okay, and, so, and, and what tradition can do, you can take somebody and just plainly lay that out. And they'll be like, nope, nope, my soul lives forever. I never die. Regardless of what the facts say. Okay, but that's because of tradition. Okay, but a critical look at the Bible, a critical look at the usage of the words matter. It matters. Okay, so now if you can take it in your mind, you can just say, okay, man does not have a mortal soul. Death actually means death. So now I can believe Solomon when he said the dead know not anything. Right? Why? Because my soul's dead. I'm dead. There's no emotion and even Ecclesiastes goes in, there's no love, there's no desire, there's no hope. All of those things that are as translated as soul, Solomon describes in the state of death, there's none of that. Okay, so now that we've settled what soul means, you know, I can understand that, you know, dead is actually dead. It's not life somewhere else. It's not a graduation. It's not a transformation from one life to the other. It's none of that. Okay, so now all of a sudden, wow, now resurrection actually means something to me. Amen. Right? Resurrection means something. And you sit on what the soul means, and now you can go like to the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, and now because you've laid hold of this truth, okay, maybe it is a parable. <laughs> because dead is dead. Okay? He didn't wait, he, his eyes didn't wake up, and he didn't see Abraham afar off. Okay, and Lazarus sitting on his chest. Why? Because I understand that a soul has, is not immortal. Right? Now think about this. I had a conversation with a person from Chicago, um, Pierre Kashmir. He said he'd be watching tonight. You know, and he was worrying about did he believe certain things that by necessity 
caused him not to believe the gospel. Okay, and I do think that there are some things that if you believe this, you probably don't believe this. Okay. So understanding, one thing that he worried about, is, is, and it's a transition, okay, he was thinking about the Trinity. Okay, he, and he, he goes, you know, I kind of struggle with that. And I'm like, well, you're struggling, you know. Well, rather Jesus was God, and I just started asking him a few questions, you, you know. But it come down to this, I'm like, well, you know, the gospel is just, you know, Christ died according to the scriptures, died for our sins according to the scriptures, was entombed and raised again. That's the gospel. Okay, I said, now what do you believe about death? He goes, I don't know. He said, do you believe? I said, I said well, that's paramount. I said, because you don't, if you don't believe that you actually die, then you actually don't believe that Jesus died. Why do you think Paul put that in there according to the Scriptures? Whatever the Scriptures teach us about death, that's what Jesus did. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's take all the fairy tale stuff out of it. Okay, Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. So it's important for us to understand what the Scriptures teach about death, okay, so that we can believe what Jesus Christ actually did. He died. He was dead. He was no less dead than I will be when I die. Okay, he was no less dead than Paul the Apostle right now. Okay, dead. He was no less dead than David who Peter proudly proclaimed that he had not ascended unto heaven. Okay? You can take all of these facts and lay it against someone that's buried in tradition, and it makes the, their tradition makes void all of these facts. I haven't given you my opinion. Okay? I haven't given you any of that. I gave you verse. This is the word. This is what the word described. Right? Okay, that's all I've done. Okay, now you have to go home, whether you're listening out on the internet or here tonight, go home and put it to the test. Get a concordance out, look at it, look at every instance that the word is used, and you're going to land in one place. Okay, you don't have a soul, you are a soul. And one day, unless the resurrection comes, you're going to die. That soul is going to die, and you're going to stay dead, like Job described it, okay, until his change comes, until resurrection. Okay, that's where the truth will take you if you study it, plain and simple. All right, thanks. A lot of information. Did you enjoy that? <laughs> I really enjoy Brother Way's teaching. He brings he brings it out of the scriptures. And if given and one thing I was sitting there thinking, one thing we might do next week, I don't know, we might continue on with it next week and look at something, is there's the flip side of it is the spirit. Because a lot of people when, when talking about this subject, about dying and going straight to heaven, they talk about the soul like Brother Whalen was dealing with today. They, they, they discuss it as if you've got a soul, something you possess or purchased or given, that you're, you are a soul. But then they'll flip over to that verse of Scripture. Do you remember where the Scriptures, I believe it's in Ecclesiastes, Solomon even said this, talks about, but the Spirit returneth unto God who gave it. They'll flip, it, they'll flip over and say, well, see there? But see, that says spirit, not soul. It's different. It, they, right, right, right. They, they talk about the soul and the spirit. They'll, they'll look at two different verses of Scripture, and they'll say, see there's something about the soul, and then you talk to them about, well, no, that's not. Well, then they'll flip over here and say, see right there? And th but it's using the word spirit. And I, I know you're not getting what I'm saying. Some of you might not. But that verse of Scripture in Genesis is a key where God formed man. What you got there? You just got a body. All you got's a body. 
That's the reason the preachers at funerals say ashes to ashes, dust to dust. These fleshly bodies return to clay. And I remember hearing a preacher preach one time talking about how your flesh is made of mainly up of carbon. That's clay. That's the same molecular structure as clay. God literally formed the human body out of dirt. But then he says, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Then man became a living soul. That is such a huge verse of scripture that if we can get, it's one plus one equals two is what that is. You take one of the ones out of there, you don't have the two anymore. And that's a key. And we might go in the next week or two and talk about that spirit. What does return back to God? Okay? And now I know some of you, and, and we death has affected a lot of people. This upsets a lot of people because the first thing they go to is mama or daddy or wife or husband that has already passed. I don't believe your loved one. I don't believe my grandmother is stuck in a box. I don't believe she's in a box. You know, a lot of people think, well, my, my loved one's not. No, they're not. And we and he mentioned that. Don't, don't let it go there with you because that's not what they're saying. And we'll look at that. A lot of people don't want to accept this about the soul because they let emotion get into it. But it doesn't change anything. It doesn't change what the truth. And we'll look into that in a week or two or next week or the following week. And uh, we'll look into that too and go on with this thought process because this is that was wonderful. He laid a great foundation of understanding what the soul means or is. Any questions for him? Anybody got any questions? Right, right. When Job even asked, the question is, you know, how many people, you've, you've been asked this, when you die, are you going to go to heaven or hell? You've been asked that question, but that question is never asked in the Bible. The question that is asked is, if a man die, shall he live again? That's the question. And this is a major, this is a big deal, guys. This is a big deal about the soul Death, and I'm glad y'all were here to hear that. I'm glad y'all were here to hear that. Any other word before we go? Thank everybody for our, our visitors for being here. I hope you come back. I know some of you travel a long way to be here, and uh, that is certainly a blessing. It, it really, it really is. And uh, I thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank y'all for watching online. And if there's no more, pr uh, no more word, we're going to close in prayer. I hope y'all have a great resurrection weekend this coming up weekend and uh, spend time with family. That's what I'm going to be doing and uh, enjoy the liberty in which we live through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the truth of the Word of God. Thank you for taking us out of tradition of men, the rudiments of the world. Thank you for taking us out of those things, Lord, and teaching us truth. And, Lord, thank you for making us students. We're not know-it-alls. There's no way we'll ever figure you out. But, Lord, your word tells us the truth, and our ignorance is no excuse. We have the word of God in front of us. You tell us to study, to show ourselves approved before God. We have every thing we need at the tips of our fingertips, Lord, today to study our Bibles. It's easier now to study than ever before, and I pray that you'll send us in the right directions. Give us what we need, most importantly, the Spirit of God that guides us in all truth. Thank you for these folks. Thank you for this ministry. We ask you to continue to bless it and give everyone safe travels home, and Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Have a good week, guys. Shake hands with one another before you leave. Y'all hang out and fellowship a little bit. And if you've got any questions that you just didn't want to bring up, you know, in front of everyone, if you'd like to talk to Waylon, I'm sure he would love to answer any question you have. So you guys have a great night, and we love you.